Uh, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president and CEO of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation serves as the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, a component of the Army War College. The center is the largest repository of the Army with a focus on individual papers, a research library, an artifact collection with strong provenance back to individual soldiers, and significant educational programs. Tonight, we have Colonel Retired Mark Viney, Mark retired from the Army in 2021 after serving 35 years in uniform. A former director of the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, Colonel Viney earned a Bachelor of Science in History from the United States Military Academy and a dual Master's of Arts in Human Resources Development and Public Administration from Webster University. He served five years on the U.S. Army War College staff and completed his Defense Strategy course. Colonel Viney has lectured on the Vietnam War Strategy at the U.S. Army War College, Texas Tech, Vietnam Center and Archives, and elsewhere. His Izzy Army War College white paper, Insights from the Vietnam Withdrawal for, for the Afghanistan Withdrawal, influenced senior allied leaders in Kabul and informed a private discussion between the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the Commander International Security Assistance Force. Considered for a position on the National Security Council, Colonel Viney has lectured on current national security issues for the Arizona State University Center on Future War and elsewhere. Colonel Viney's first book, is United States Cavalry Peacekeeping Operation in Bosnia, an inside account of Operation Joint Endeavor 1996. He conceived, researched, and obtained Secretary of the Army approval to add a campaign streamer to the U.S. Army, uh, Army flag for stability operations in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He received the Admiral George C. Dwyer Award for Officer Review Magazine for his article, Journey to the, uh, to the Front. Colonel Wayne is now a management consultant with the largest consulting firm in the United States. He is also finder of Viney Development Solutions, which provides nonfiction books and public speaking on historical and national defense topics, leadership development, plus executive talent and development coaching and historical tours. I, I would ask you to hold your questions to the end. Please use the question and uh, answer icon to submit your questions. Mark, the floor is now yours. Well, thanks, Mike, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for dialing in tonight. We have about 100 attendees on the line, which seems to me a good indication of the enduring interest and emotion that linger around the national tragedy that was the Vietnam War. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce you to one of the most important yet little known figures in our nation's military history to correct enduring misperceptions about what he and his colleagues on the Joint Chiefs of Staff did or did not do during the Vietnam War to reveal what they actually did instead and why in their attempt to steer the war toward a more successful conclusion. Plus, I'll offer some insights on civilian military relations for today's contentious national security environment. First though, I'd like to thank the Army Heritage Center Foundation for hosting this webinar series. When I directed the Army Heritage and Education Center in 2009 to 2011, one of our objectives was to grow the center from a beloved regional asset to a nationally recognized treasure that is widely utilized by both the Army and the American public. And it's been really great to watch how that dream has become a reality over the past decade. The center's tremendous growth is attributable in very large measure to the enthusiastic support of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. And so I wanna thank the foundation's president and CEO, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Mike Perry, and the chairman of the foundation's board of directors, Major General Retired Bob Diamond, and his predecessor, Major General Retired Bob Scales. And I wish General Scales good health. I wanna thank all three of these individuals for their many years of leadership, partnership and commitment to the shared mission of the center and the foundation, as well as for our enduring friendship. I'd also like to congratulate the staff of the US Army Heritage and Education Center, its historians, librarians, research assistants, collection managers, museum curators, conservators, educators, and yes, its volunteers. The tremendous increase in the center's reputation and its service to patrons and visitors could not have occurred without their dedicated and integrated service. They are first-rate professionals who know their business and they are what make the center the national treasure that it is. 
March 29th was National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And so I also want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the Vietnam veterans in attendance for your service and sacrifice. One of my takeaways tonight is that I want you, our Vietnam veterans, to know that the near universal emotions of anger, sadness, and disappointment that you all still feel over that war extended all the way to the top of the military chain of command. The subject of our webinar tonight, General Earl Wheeler was very proud of the accomplishments of the American servicemen and women who fought in Vietnam. He thought you all deserve the better judgment of history. In June, 1968, Wheeler stated, despite the torrent of words and pictures that have come from Vietnam, this war remains the least understood in our history. Americans, as they more fully understand the magnificent record of our armed forces in Vietnam, will accord these young men that full measure of respect and honor, which is their due. And if we were in an actual room together right now, I think we'd all be giving our Vietnam veterans a well-deserved round of applause. I wanna to begin tonight with the story of how I went from merely revealing an unknown top secret operational plan that might have altered the course of the Vietnam War to becoming General Wheeler's biographer and ultimately an apologist for his and the Joint Chiefs of Staff's performance during the war. I am a fourth generation U.S. Army officer. I grew up on my forefathers' war stories from World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Dominican Republic, the Vietnam War, and Grenada. As a kid, I spent many summers with my grandparents on their farm in Kansas. My grandfather, Colonel George C. Viney, retired from the Army in 1975 and assumed management of the farm that our family first staked out of the open prairie in 1878. Kansas was many hours driving time away from the military post that we lived on, Fort Campbell, Fort Bragg, Fort Benning. So I had ample time to listen to my grandfather's war stories. He often lamented how horribly wrong the Vietnam War had been fought. My grandfather was convinced that it could have gone much better had the president only approved the invasion of North Vietnam that he planned in secret for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Throughout my military career, my grandfather's invasion story intrigued me. And so I interviewed him about it in 2010 as part of the Military History Institute's Veteran Oral History Program. It was called Operation Mule Shoe. I got the details of the plan as my grandfather recalled them, and then I set out to corroborate his story. Since my grandfather planned this invasion of North Vietnam for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I decided to see if I could discover anything about it in General Wheeler's official records at the National Archives. I did, along with a trove of relevant top secret documents that I was able to declassify. In 2011, I took my findings about this plan to invade North Vietnam on the road. And I did several lectures at the US Army War College, the Vietnam Center and Archive at Texas Tech and elsewhere. I also drafted an article for the Journal of Military History. I shared my preliminary findings with several history PhDs, including John Prados, Con Crane, Bill Allison, Mike Nyberg, Bob Sorley, and the late Joe Gilmartin. They realized the significance of this new material that I had and how much of it I had, and they encouraged me to flesh it out into a book. At some point, General Wheeler's only son, Dr. Ben Wheeler, contacted me and made me an offer I could not refuse. He said he'd been looking for someone to write his father's biography for 35 years and that if I would agree to do it, he would give me access to everything the family had regarding his father's military service. This included official records, photo albums, recordings of interviews, 
an FBI background investigation, and most importantly, boxes of letters that his mother, General Wheeler's wife, wrote to her mother over the course of Wheeler's military career. It was an absolute gold mine and the opportunity of a lifetime. Now, I knew almost nothing about Wheeler when I began my research, beyond that he was a figure of considerable controversy. I had no preconceived notions of him. I never felt pressured by the family to cast light, to cast Wheeler in a certain positive light. Rather, I adhered to my responsibility to discover the facts and remain fair, balanced, and impartial throughout my research. So starting in 2013, after I returned from a year in Afghanistan, I dove into this treasure trove of primary material from the National Archives, the Military History Institute, and the Wheeler family. And over the course of the next eight years, I created a manuscript of 300,000 words. It was huge, literally and figuratively. The manuscript was just too big for one book, so I split it into two. Mike, could I have the next slide, please? So tonight, I'll focus on the second book in the series, Determined to Persist, General Earl Wheeler, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Military's Foiled Pursuit of Victory in Vietnam. This book was published in November, and it highlights the internal debates, tensions, and critical inflection points of the Johnson and Nixon administration's strategic direction of the Vietnam War during Wheeler's tenure from July 1964 to July 1970. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? So later tonight, I'll preview some material from the first book in the series, which is entitled General and Mrs. Wheeler, Earl Wheeler, Their Rise to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Amid America's Descent into Vietnam. That book will be published in June. And besides being Wheeler's biography, it also details the Joint Chiefs of Staff's involvement in Southeast Asia planning and policymaking between the Truman and Kennedy administrations, and during the first year of the Johnson administration. And it also highlights the myriad other matters that Wheeler contended with during his tenure as chairman besides Vietnam. So if you wanna get the full story on Wheeler, the chiefs in Vietnam, you should start with General and Mrs. Wheeler and then read Determined to Persist. But if you've already read the latter, that's no problem. I'm sure you'll wanna know more about Wheeler the man and how he got to the top position in the US military hierarchy. Mike, could I have the next slide, please? So let's talk about some incorrect perceptions of Wheeler and the chiefs and why they have endured. When I set out to corroborate my grandfather's recollections of Operation Mule Shoe in 2010, I discovered that the Vietnam experts knew only generalizations about the plan, that it had existed, but they knew none of the details. No single historian, no matter how learned or distinguished they are, has a crystal ball or a time machine with which to know with absolute certainty all there is to know about the important figures, events, or periods of our past. Disparate interpretations result. And these interpretations evolve over time as more information becomes available, or at least they should. Historiography is a collective, collaborative effort among historians that is, I think, akin to building a jigsaw puzzle together in which the complete image is obscured. It's a lengthy process over decades wherein individual historians locate missing pieces of the puzzle and fit them together. And we can never see the puzzle in its entirety or with 100% accuracy, but over time and through the contributions of many, a more perfect, complete, and accurate shared understanding is formed. I have been truly blessed to have this opportunity to contribute to the puzzle that is our collective understanding of the Vietnam War, several pieces pertaining to one of its major figures and his colleagues on the Joint Staff, Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
So let's talk about this photo, which was taken on July 22nd, 1964. Who are these individuals? You probably recognize President Lyndon Johnson hunched over the table on the left, but who is this man leaning over the president and the secretary of defense who's not visible in this photo? You registered for this webinar tonight, so you probably surmise that it is General Wheeler. But what if I walked up to someone on the street and asked them to identify this person gesturing so forcefully? Could anyone identify him? I think if you asked a thousand people, not one person could. One thing that is great about this photo is how it represents the enigma that Wheeler has remained for over 50 years. You can't see his face. He's out of focus. We don't see him clearly. We don't understand him. And until now, we have not had an accurate picture of what he did or did not do. Mike, could I have the next slide, please? If you watched Ken Burns' Vietnam documentary video series, you saw images like this in all 10 episodes. Obviously, Wheeler was a very important person, a member of the president's inner circle. And yet, throughout the series, his name was not mentioned even once. Why was that? Wheeler was one of the most visible, central, and important figures of the Vietnam era. And yet, it's like he was erased from the story. What if I told you that was deliberate? After his retirement in 1970, Wheeler was given an office in the Pentagon for the purpose of writing his autobiography. And like every Vietnam veteran I've ever known, regardless of rank, branch of service, unit, or time period of service in country, Wheeler was sad, angry, and disappointed with how the Vietnam War had been fought and lost. And one morning in 1972, he walked into his office and in disgust, he told his secretary to shred the manuscript of several hundred pages that he had worked on for over two years. Wheeler's son had badgered him to complete his autobiography. And Wheeler finally exploded one day. If you believe that as a professional soldier, I am in any way proud of my association with the Vietnam War, you are damn wrong. I don't want to hear another word about that goddamn war. Do you understand? It's fascinating that Wheeler would shred his memoirs, that he would attempt to disassociate himself from the war with which he is inextricably linked. He was a student of military history. He had outlined a book on American Civil War history, but he never had the chance to complete it. Wheeler knew full well he was robbing future generations from ever fully understanding his perspectives and his actions regarding the Vietnam War. And he had several reasons for shredding his memoirs, and we can talk about that later if anyone is interested. Wheeler died three years later, just five years after his retirement. In consequence, a gaping hole has existed in the historiography of the Vietnam War until now. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Another great thing about this photo is that it belies many enduring inaccurate perceptions of Wheeler and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Military historian Andrew Bertel noted in 2014, 50 years after the deployment of the first US combat troops to Vietnam, Americans still have much to learn about the Vietnam War. Half-truths and misunderstandings clutter the historical literature, making it difficult to obtain an accurate picture of this controversial event. History is important, Bertel suggests, not just for its own sake, but because conceptions of the past, be they accurate or not, often shape the decisions of later generations. This certainly has been true of Vietnam as people have dredged up the alleged lessons of the war every time America has contemplated using force since 1975. It is imperative, Bertel goes on to assert, that Americans today comprehend one of the most traumatic events in our national history 
and understand the collective failures and shortcomings of national policy and leadership that joined, fought, and ultimately lost the Vietnam War. Army General Bruce Palmer Jr. served as Vice Chief of Staff of the Army from 1968 to 1972 when he became Acting Chief of Staff of the Army. In 1984, Palmer criticized his peers on the Joint Chiefs of Staff for their response to President Johnson's temporizing on Vietnam. Palmer wrote, senior U.S. military leaders recognized the weaknesses of the U.S. strategy being pursued, but unfortunately seemed unable to articulate their misgivings and communicate them effectively to their civilian superiors. Our military leaders failed to get across the message that the U.S. strategy was not working and over time would probably fail to achieve stated U.S. In objectives. Indeed, the chiefs apparently did not clearly and unequivocally tell the president and the secretary of defense that the strategy was fatally flawed and that U.S. objectives were not achievable unless the strategy was changed. Now, Palmer's accusations were shocking and intuitively they are hard to believe. According to journalist and author Mark Perry, in 1989, Wheeler was still considered within the military as one of the most important and influential officers in Joint Chiefs of Staff history. Wheeler's reputation did not diminish until after 1997, when a mid-level Army officer and military historian, Major, now Lieutenant General retired, H.R. McMaster, labeled Wheeler and the Chiefs five silent men. McMaster accused them, President Johnson and his civilian advisors, of arrogance, weakness, lying in pursuit of self-interest, and above all, the abdication of responsibility to the American people. All this during the first year of Wheeler's six-year tenure as chairman. For 25 years, McMaster's national bestseller, Dereliction of Duty, has been regarded as the authoritative work on the machinations of Johnson's Vietnam policy. And for lack of evidence to the contrary, Palmer's and McMaster's accusations have perpetuated. Sir Max Hastings is a preeminent military historian and the author of 26 books. In 2012, Hastings received the Pritzker Military Library of Chicago's Literary Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing. In his 2018 survey of the Vietnam War, Hastings summarily dismissed Wheeler as weak. Now, let me make one thing perfectly clear. I am not here to denigrate the senior officers and the historians whom I have just named. Going back to my puzzle analogy, I am merely stating that they did not see all the pieces that are now available. But there is the matter of interpretation. Other military historians and senior military officers have felt that Palmer's and McMaster's accusations against Wheeler and the Chiefs do not ring true. General retired George Casey, who served as Chief of Staff of the Army from 2007 to 2011, observed there has to have been more to the story. In 2009, military historian, Dr. John Prados challenged Palmer's and McMaster's portrayals of Wheeler and the Chiefs as parochial, unimaginative, yes men, complicit with and unable to effectively articulate recommendations and consequences to the unreceptive Johnson administration. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? My research reinforces Prado's and demonstrates conclusively that Wheeler and the Chiefs were not derelict passive accomplices to civilian mismanagement of the war in 1964-65. On the contrary, during that period, and the subsequent and preponderant five years of Wheeler's tenure as chairman, he and the chiefs determined to persist in aggressively and proactively providing consistent 
doctrinally grounded strategic recommendations and potential consequences to the Johnson administration and then to the more receptive but politically constrained Nixon administration. My research reveals that between August 1964 and July 1970, Wheeler, the chiefs, and senior military commanders offered 143 documented recommendations to the two administrations for pursuing the war toward a traditional military victory. In addition to these documented instances, senior military advisors to the president offered far more undocumented recommendations during phone calls, off the record meetings, informal hallway discussions, and during social events and ceremonies. Assuming a conservative number of five such undocumented instances occurred for each one for which documentary evidence exists, senior military leaders offered at least 700 consistent doctrinal recommendations during this six-year period. At the same time, the chiefs also cautioned the Johnson and Nixon administration's 70 documented times about the potential negative military consequences of pending non-doctrinal decisions that the administrations were then contemplating. Applying the same formula, senior military leaders warned at least 350 times that the administration's non-doctrinal decisions would undermine rather than promote attainment of U.S. objectives in Vietnam. Thus, there is no doubt that senior military advisors to the president made their opinions known. Five silent men, no way. Presidents Johnson and Nixon had a broad range of information provided to them from multiple advisory sources, and they rendered decisions in accordance with their own prerogatives and priorities. Now, with an eye on time, let me get a little more specific about what Wheeler and the Chiefs advocated. Although Lyndon Johnson was perhaps the most intimidating president to occupy the Oval Office, Wheeler was undaunted. He was no shrinking violet, and he openly resisted Johnson's restrictive Vietnam War policies, both publicly and behind the scenes. Wheeler was concerned by the Vietnam War's debilitating effect on America's worldwide military posture, and so he persistently but unsuccessfully sought from May 1965 through February 1968 to convince President Johnson to authorize mobilization to reconstitute the strategic reserve. Now, this fact has been well known in the historiography for years. What has not been understood is that between June 1965 and March 1969, Wheeler also persisted in recommending a more aggressive offensive air and ground strategy to defeat the North Vietnamese will and capability to continue the fight. Wheeler had a specific plan for how to begin to accomplish this. The centerpiece of his strategy was Operation Mule Shoe, the invasion plan that my grandfather developed for Wheeler. Mule Shoe was a top secret, limited distribution plan for a short-term invasion into Southern North Vietnam by four US divisions, to destroy enemy sanctuary areas and logistic sites that had functioned with impunity there under the Johnson administration's restrictive rules of engagement. Wheeler intended it as a foot in the door, a precursor to extended ground combat operations in North Vietnam. Mule Shoe was the mother of all invasion plans, the most thoroughly developed plan that informed all other nascent U.S. Pacific Command and U.S. Military Assistance Command Vietnam invasion plans. And we can go into more detail about Operation Mule Shoe and its significance later if anyone is interested. The operative question I explored is why did Wheeler and the Chiefs vigorously, consistently offer so many recommendations toward a traditional military victory in the face of tremendous and equally consistent opposition from most of the president's civilian national security advisors. What underpinned the chief's logic? The short answer is warfighting doctrine. To military professionals, wars when fought are meant to be won. As General of the Army Douglas MacArthur stated, there is no substitute for victory. Wheeler, the chiefs, and other senior military officers understood 
and articulated to the President and the Secretary of Defense what Welsh Major General Henry H. E. Lloyd understood back in the 18th century. Lloyd wrote, this art of war, like all others, is founded on certain and fixed principles, which are by their nature invariable. The application of them can only be varied, but they themselves are constant. And so our senior military leaders endeavored to apply the principles of war, namely the principles of mass, offensive, and maneuver against the North Vietnamese center of gravity, its army, to defeat North Vietnamese will and capability to fight. In order to win the war in as short a time as possible and to minimize the cost in US lives and dollars, you do that by overwhelming the enemy early on. This was the fundamental behind the first Iraq War, more commonly referred to as Operation Desert Storm, perhaps the most one sided and complete operational victory ever fought by the US military. In the space of 34 days, we destroyed the Iraqi army and killed over 110,000 Iraqi soldiers at the cost of only 294 US dead. It's the same shock and awe principle that apparently the Russians attempted unsuccessfully in Ukraine. Now, let me make something else very clear. My purpose in this book was to explain why the Wheeler and the Chiefs acted as they did, not to claim that they had a magic bullet, that had they been allowed to use it, the US military could have won the war. Vietnam historiography is clear that US combat involvement in Vietnam was doomed to fail from the start. What I find truly fascinating about the Vietnam War is how its participants viewed the same issues and events from radically different perspectives and how they often drew the opposite conclusions on what needed to be done. It reminds me of that story of the three blind men and the elephant. The first blind man touches the elephant on its trunk and he thinks it's a giant snake. And the second blind man touches the elephant on the leg and he thinks it's a tree. And the third blind man touches the elephant on the tail, he thinks it's a donkey. President Johnson regarded Vietnam not as a war to be won, but as an irritant and a distraction to be managed so as not to derail his domestic policy agenda. Military advice was something to be resisted. And this photo is metaphorical of that point if you consider the body language. Johnson's civilian foreign policy advisors regarded the Vietnam conflict as something new, not war, but pseudo war. And so to them, it was appropriate to experiment, to attempt to apply new means for fighting as economically as possible, applying just enough resources, but not too much to get the job done. Among his military colleagues, Wheeler privately derided this line of thinking as military theology, long on hope, but short on empirical evidence that it could succeed. This then raises a pertinent question for us today, the question of military dissent and whether and when it is appropriate to resign in protest. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Think back just eight months ago to the acrimony and the calls for resignations and for somebody to be fired over our sudden defeat in Afghanistan. And I'm pretty sure all of us who served in Afghanistan hate the way it ended. For the first time, I finally had an inkling of the anger, sadness, and disappointment felt by Vietnam veterans. I personally believe that our recent defeat in Afghanistan was more ignominious than either the fall of the Philippines in World War II or our defeat in Vietnam. No, in Afghanistan, we did not lose 23,000 US and 100,000 allied troops captured like we did in the Philippines. And no, we did not lose 60,000 killed and 300,000 wounded like we did in Vietnam. But consider the impact of our defeats on those allied countries that we were fighting to defend. We liberated the Philippines from Japanese occupation two and a half years later. South Vietnam survived another two years after our withdrawal 
before its 16 million people lost what freedoms they had in that imperfect democracy. Afghanistan collapsed immediately upon our precipitous withdrawal and 38 million people lost their freedom in that imperfect democracy. And to think that it is recorded in history as Operation Enduring Freedom. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? So senior, so fellow senior military officers, what do we do when we disagree with or cannot dissuade our elected officials whom we serve from a course of action that we know will not achieve national policy objectives or will have unintended negative consequences? Resign in protest, as some people have argued that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, should have done. General Wheeler and his JCS colleagues face this very issue and their thoughts are insightful. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Wheeler stated in a speech before the Armed Forces Staff College in October 1967, let us never forget that in a democracy such as ours, it is the grave responsibility of the elected commander in chief to make the final decisions. He does so after carefully weighing the counsel he has obtained from the Congress and from his various advisors, including the military. I believe that a better understanding of this democratic process would be more helpful to all concerned. I believe that this is the proper attitude military men should take when called upon to respond to questions regarding differences of view between statutory civilian officials of our government and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Wheeler and the Chiefs spoke truth to power to the Secretary of Defense and the President, but they moderated their arguments based on their shared conviction that it was the president's ultimate prerogative to wage the war as he saw fit. Wheeler stated in 1973, it has always been my view that the role of the military under civilian authority and the need for discipline and obedience of orders of civilian leaders is absolute, paramount in a democracy. Otherwise, you would have nothing but chaos in your armed forces. In fact, you wouldn't have armed forces, you would have a mob. I don't think any of us want that. Now, General Milley stated almost exactly the same thing last fall in his testimony regarding our defeat in Afghanistan. Wheeler stated, our recommendations may not always be accepted to the degree with which we consider militarily desirable, but once the decision has been made, it has been our job to implement the decision to the best of our ability. This is how it should be. General Harold K. Johnson succeeded Wheeler as Chief of Staff of the Army and served in that role from July 1964 to July 1968. Johnson stated in 1978, we were following a classic role of military subordination to political authority, to civilian authority. You argue your case up to the point of decision. Having been given a decision, you carry it out with all the force that you can, put all your effort behind carrying it out. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Now, having heard these affirmative statements of military subordination from Wheeler and Johnson, you may be startled to learn that on 25 August, 1967, they and their colleagues on the Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously decided to resign in mass. This was after Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara breached their trust in his contradictory testimony before Congress regarding the strategic air campaign against North Vietnam. Initially in league with his colleagues, Wheeler dissuaded them and they got back to work as this picture taken four days later attests. The chiefs, had been unanimous in their decision to resign. They swore never to reveal it, and some of them later officially denied it. And we can talk more about this incident later if anyone's interested. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? I would encourage those who fault General Milley and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and believe they should have either resigned or been fired to give them the benefit of a doubt. 
In my 12 years of researching and coming to understand the strategic direction of the Vietnam War, I have learned that there is so much dialogue that occurs behind the scenes that never becomes known to the public. I believe that decades from now, when records about our defeat in Afghanistan are declassified and assessed, we will see that our nation's top military leaders did in fact perform their statutory duty, spoke truth to power, advised the commander in chief and cautioned him on potential negative outcomes of policy decisions that only he could make. And this is precisely what I have revealed happened during the Vietnam War. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Before we get to questions, I wanna take just a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about Earl Wheeler, the officer and the man, as well as his exceptional wife. And you may have noted the curious title of this book and wondered what that is all about. Wheeler was an exceptional officer and a very decent human being. He was hardworking, self-sacrificing, diplomatic, articulate, suave, no nonsense yet personable, congenial, gregarious, and humorous. He was a devoted family man and a patriotic American, and it is no wonder that he rose to the pinnacle of the military profession. Wheeler's wife, Betty, played a major role in his professional success. A daughter of considerable wealth, Betty was a grand dame in a poor man's army. And her hard work, social skills, and hospitality played an essential and substantial role in the success for her husband's military career. Together, the Wheelers made a great team and they are what we would call today a power couple. Theirs is a fascinating story, a social history of army officer families spanning the interwar, World War II, and the Cold War eras that is interwoven with the increasing US involvement in Southeast Asia. And you'll also get a sense for the myriad other issues Wheeler contended with as chairman besides the Vietnam War. Mike, can I have the next slide, please? Some final thoughts in conclusion. Senior officers of the US Armed Forces must be assertive. An overly servile attitude toward appointed civilian officials in the Department of Defense and a reluctance to take an independent stance would greatly devalue professional military expertise or the chance that it will be heard and considered by the president. The Joint Chiefs of Staff have a statutory obligation to serve as the principal military advisors to the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Council, and the president. Regardless of a certain president's predisposition toward professional soldiers, the chiefs have the right to personally advise their commander in chief and seek to influence him before decisions are made. They must fulfill their advisory role by persistently ensuring their views are given balanced consideration with other agencies within the Department of Defense, interagency forums, and by the president. General Earl Wheeler and his JCS colleagues embodied this standard. Inaccurately maligned, Wheeler's reputation should be restored. He was indeed one of the most important and influential chairmen in Joint Chiefs of Staff history. Perry had it right back in 1989 when he wrote, amid personal defeat and national humiliation, Wheeler significantly strengthened the role of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, winning with his silence and loyalty what could never have been won by him resigning instead. More than any of his predecessors, Wheeler was willing to push the chief's programs and policies, even to consider mutiny, to win a voice for the military in the back rooms of official Washington. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and more importantly, Joint Staff Officers are in large part the product of his service. Mike, can I have the last slide, please? So I wanna thank you all for joining me tonight. It's been a pleasure to share with you what I have learned. I'd love to speak to other groups interested in any of the topics we've covered. If you represent such a group, please contact me at my email address at the bottom of this slide. And I'd also like to dialogue with individuals too. If you are on the staff or faculty of an institution of higher learning, including especially one of our senior service colleges, please consider incorporating these books into your curriculum. Determined to Persist is currently available in paperback or eback versions in the Book Baby Bookshop or on Amazon. 
General and Mrs. Earl Wheeler will be published in June. Please leave a review on both books and thanks again, everybody. Mike, back over to you for questions. Okay, we have questions. Uh, we'll start off with uh, the unknown attendee or the anonymous attendee. How do you view the effective joint military CIA operations being negatively portrayed by the media and by history? Did you look at that aspect? The joint CIA and military operations? Operations. I did not specifically okay. get into that. Okay. This is from Jeff. You say that war was lost from the beginning. Was it possible to attain a north-south split similar to that of the Korea with the two sovereign nations? Well, I mean, that's what was created from the Geneva Convention of 1954 that split Vietnam into two entities, North and South. Of course, the North Vietnamese never believed that established two separate countries. The South Vietnamese believed that it did. When I said that it was unwinnable from the beginning, you have to look back at the conditions, the limitations, the amount of resources that the Johnson administration was willing to put into this effort. As I stated, Johnson didn't fight this to win. He merely wanted to lose or to keep it from boiling over, to keep it from detracting from his domestic agenda, the Great Society programs. And so when I say it was unwinnable from the beginning, Johnson was, would, would never seriously consider the amount of military effort that the military believed was needed to attack significantly the North Vietnamese will and capability using overwhelming firepower, much like I described in the first Gulf War. It just was an impossibility. So when you look at military revisionism, of which I am not, you've got to understand the circumstances and you got to see, well, well, all these options were on the table, but none of them, they were considered, but they were not adopted. And so you can't go back and say only if, it's just counterfactual. Okay. Against, uh, this is from uh, Stephen. Uh, he said he missed the beginning. Was your uh, grandfather George C. Viney? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he was an uh, infantry officer, and he was uh, on the Joint Staff's J-3 Pacific Division from 1966 to 1968. And remarkably, I find this fascinating, he was the only officer in the Pacific Division who had actually served in Vietnam at that late stage in the war. That's mind-boggling to me. Just to verify, did he subscribe to an unwinnable war thesis? No, he believe that, like many, I mean, Westmoreland, Sharp, um, you know, a host of other senior military leaders believed that had they been allowed to take off the gloves, we could have won. But Greg Dattis and John Prados are very clear in, in their presentations that, again, the conditions did not allow adoption of such stronger measures. Um, but it is fascinating to see because immediately after the war, after we lost, the military all turned and pointed the finger at our civilian leaders. Now, what I am saying is that, yeah, it was the senior leaders, it was the Secretary of Defense and the President made the ultimate decisions. And that's the point I'm trying to stress is that the Wheeler and the Joint Chief Staff had an advisory role. They weren't the decision makers. And in our system of military subordination to civilian authority, that is the way it must be. But it's fascinating to look back at the recriminations after our defeat in Vietnam. Okay, uh, this is from um, uh, Jim. Uh, did Wheeler get into the discussion on, on tactics and whether search and destroy uh, tactics was actually providing the type of security that the Vietnam uh, citizens needed in order to feel secure? Wheeler recognized that Washington was too far away to get into the particulars of the combatant commander's operational plans. And so he correctly saw his role as providing the resources to enable Westmoreland and later Abrams to execute their strategy. Uh, and there's a quote in the book to that effect that the, the joint staff does very well 
at providing information, but it is not their strength to provide, um, to, to second guess, if you will, the combatant commander. So he worked very closely with Westmoreland, uh, equally closely with uh, Abrams. They communicated through back channel traffic uh, almost daily. And I used uh, quite a lot of that in uh, my research. And it's really pretty fascinating to see how synchronized they all were as far as what needed to be done. And that was to fight the war, get it over with as soon as possible, overwhelm the enemy, minimize US casualties, minimize cost, just get it over and done. Okay, this question is from Dave. Uh, when you look at the correspondence of General Wheeler, uh, he was picked over several more uh, senior World War II combat commanders uh, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Did you any, find any criticism in, in correspondence about his selection? Uh, yeah, there was considerable um, criticism of Wheeler's lack of combat experience vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other uh, officers who had held that position, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff before him. So, so you had a number of these senior officers were, were war heroes, if you will. Uh, LeMay, Curtis LeMay, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, was particularly outspoken in his criticism of Wheeler's lack of com uh, combat command experience. Now, what you'll see in the first book, General and Mrs. Wheeler, is exactly what Wheeler did during World War II and how that directly underpinned his success as a general officer. So Wheeler started out as an infantry battalion commander, uh, but because of how well he'd done at the Command and General Staff College, he was slated for general staff work. He served as a Division G3 and then as a Division Chief of Staff for two years with the 63rd Infantry Division. And that's where he learned administration and logistics. Um, he did not command <coughs> infantry forces. He did not earn any gallantry awards, but he really, what he did learn was how to operate larger level organizations. Now, General George Casey, I had a conversation with him about this, and he said, I've commanded, or I've been a, a chief of staff in a division, and I can tell you that job does indeed prepare you to be a general officer. And so that's very fascinating. I give quite a lot uh, of, of focus to Wheeler's World War II experience, and you'll see exactly how highly thought of he was by his superiors. It's, it's, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, this uh, question is from Jim. Uh, he said, uh, you said that the NVA was North Vietnam's center of gravity. Could you not also argue that the North Vietnamese Politburo was their center of gravity? And if so, would not a deeper invasion of North Vietnam have been necessary? Well, the military, our senior military commanders wanted to attack the North's will and capability to continue the fight. So will obviously pertains to the Politburo, Bureau, the, the North Vietnamese leaders in Hanoi. Um, so certainly that, that is part of that. Um, the problem was about how much you could do in North Vietnam without inciting a Chinese intervention. So what you'll see about Operation Mule Shoe was it was limited in duration it only went about 40 kilometers north of the DMZ, and the forces immediately turned south and worked their way back toward the DMZ, destroying the logistics uh, uh, facilities in that area. But the, in this Operation Mule Show, they did a special national security or national intelligence estimate uh, that predicted there was a good chance that the Chinese would come in um, and that they would not believe that our objectives were limited. So this was a, a big risk. Um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, didn't believe it was significant that it was kind of 50-50. The civilian foreign, senior foreign policy advisors, the president, um, put much more stock in Chinese intervention. But the chiefs thought it could be managed if they did come in. Uh, and we get in and out, possibly before the Chinese could even react. Could you give more detail on the plan? That's a question from Jack. 
Yeah, what uh, it's, it's really fascinating, and it's uh, it, it was an, a very audacious plan. So it involved four U.S. divisions. The third Marine division would attack across the DMZ to fix enemy forces in these logistics areas. A air assault by the complete First Cavalry Division would go into the foothills of the highlands to the west of the objective area. The 82nd Airborne Division for the first time would deploy from the continental United States into combat by parachute assault. And they would form the top of the box to engage enemy from north to south, but they'd also defend against counterattack from the north. And then the 5th Marine Division would do the first amphibious division size assault since the Incheon landing 16 uh, years earlier. So it was very audacious. Um, a lot of moving parts. One of the things that was pretty incredible was it would have utilized the entire C-130 and C-141 inventories for the duration of the operation. Um, they sold it as a two-week operation, which was not realistic for what they were trying to accomplish. Um, but that's how they couched it, because to try to say we're going to stay there longer or this is a precursor to sustained operations, they couldn't have sold it to anybody that way. It's fascinating to me that all of the Joint Chiefs of Staff eventually came around and by March 1968, after the Tet Offensive, they did get the unanimity that Wheeler needed to present it to the president. But by that point, of course, the domestic political situation had changed. It was unexecutable. What role for the Air Force and what role for the, the surface Navy, not the Marines, but the, the shipboard Navy? Well, there was quite a, there was a large role. I mean, you still had uh, Operation Rolling Thunder was going on in the North. That would have to be coordinated with the massive amount of air power that was being required for this operation. Besides the lift, you had tactical fighter squadrons, tactical, tactical reconnaissance squadrons. Those would all have to be synchronized. Um, as, far, as, far, as far as the surface Navy operations, uh, you had naval gunfire support. At that point, the battleship New Jersey, I believe, was still on station. Uh, that could have been available. But naval gunfire support could range, you know, almost 16 miles, could co completely cover the objective area. So very major roles for both of them. Um, this plan, as you'll see in the book, it was very well developed, 150 pages, very detailed. When Wheeler presented it to the U.S. Uh, Pacific Command, and the MACV staffs in October 97, their plans were only three and 15 pages respectively. So when I say this was the mother of all plans, it is worth going back to take a look at. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, next question, uh, did individuals within the Johnson administration try to divide the university, uh, you know, you know, unanimity, excuse me, of the, of the Joint Chiefs? Absolutely. Uh, and, and what comes to mind is a specific conversation that happened, I believe, in 1964 when President Johnson was talking with the chiefs and they went in with an agreed upon position. Uh, but Johnson leveraged um, the commandant of the Marine Corps to suggest that, well, we, 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 could, we could do with a lower number. And so that was what was, was focused on. So yes, the, the unanimity among the chiefs absolutely did exist early in the 1964 uh, period that General McMaster writes about. But after the fall of 64, Wheeler made it very clear that there was no dissension between the chiefs. And the director of the Joint Staff made it very clear that because of the somewhat adversarial relationship with the civilians, uh, civilian foreign policy advisors, the chiefs had to come together and they were more cooperative uh, than they were previously. Well, then let's ask, who was the most uh, opposed to the, term, the, the Joint Chiefs? Which uh, of Johnson administration's officials? Who was most opposed? To, to their, who, who try to break their, their unity the most? State well, McNamara certainly, 
uh, had his own ideas of how the war should be formed. Okay. John McNaughton, William Bundy, together they formed what I termed the triumvirate, who had the president's ear uh, and pursued the graduated strategy, a uh, graduated response strategy. So, so they were the predominant um, adversaries, if you will. But I use the term adversaries is not a good word because what's amazing to me is in our culture, you would think it would be very adversarial. But as the, the war went on and it became more and more frustrating, it is fascinating to me that the military and civilians in the Johnson administration actually came closer together and they were on very friendly terms. It is, it is a concept that is foreign to us in, in our climate in Washington today. Well, then, then this comes, uh, this is a good follow on to Dave's question and, and maybe we can go somewhere else afterwards. Uh, Dave uh, asked if victory was, if total victory was not possible, what did General Wheeler and the Joint Chiefs consider to be a successful end state? They still considered they still wanted to defeat the North Vietnamese will and capability to continue the war. So they never varied from what they were saying is you've got to do more to get it over with. Um, they resisted active, actively the bombing halts, the calls to limit the level of troops, the withdrawals that came later. They said, you, the doctrine was clear, you, you've got to fight use all of your power, use your strengths to defeat the enemy. So they never got away from defeating the North Vietnamese will and capability to fight. Well, this then is a segue. Uh, your first book was about the military experience in Eastern Europe. Uh, that experience might give you a, a, some insight on the current situation in Ukraine. I'm taking you off on a total different tangent. Are you willing to perhaps consider another book along that line? Uh, maybe. Uh, when I was still on the staff of the U.S. Army um, Europe uh, headquarters, I did do a lecture for the Arizona State University Center on the Future of War about the Russian threat. And so I have been following what's been going on uh, in Ukraine very closely. And I think it's fascinating. Uh, I was talking to a, a young officer who my coach and I tell him about how we train. I mean, my entire career going back to the Cold War, trained to fight the Soviets, and now we see it actually playing out. And it's uh, it's it's just a fascinating thing. So I, I might I might do something on that. I've got a couple other projects uh, in mind. Before well, that. closing, what other comments do you have? What would you like to well pass on as we we conclude tonight? I wrote these books for strategic leaders. And I believe that they should be adopted by our senior service colleges. Um, because as I said earlier, there have been some enduring misperceptions that need to be corrected. And the experiences of Wheeler and the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Vietnam are extremely relevant to the current situation, the contentious national security environment that we find ourselves in today, absolutely relevant. And I hope that these books will get the attention that uh, they deserve. I believe that with my heart, uh, General Wheeler does deserve the better judgment of history. And that was my conclusion by the end of my research. Well, Mark, I wanna thank you. Uh, there were a couple of questions I thought that were best answered in writing rather than uh, trying to go into uh, detail. I'll pass those to you if, if you don't mind getting back I'd to the individuals. To. Uh, I wanna thank you for tonight and I hope that you can get up here uh, sometime soon uh, and uh, dive through the archives once again. I'd like to invite everybody back uh, towards the end of April. I believe it is the uh, 27th of April. We're gonna drop down to the bottom end of the Vietnam War. We're gonna talk about the memoir of an aerial scout in Vietnam with Colonel Retired Dave pa uh, Porter. So you, you were dealing at the top, top level. Well, we're gonna go back down to a guy who's getting shot at. So uh, I would invite you back uh, 7 p.m. on the 27th of April. So thanks, Mark, thanks, and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.